Starship can't decide whether it wants to be fully stacked or not and Virgin Orbit has arrived for the first ever launch from the UK. We'll be getting super excited about that as well as a lot more in Monday's Tomorrow Space News. First of all, let's start off with the biggest news of the week, physically. Part 1 of the full stack was Booster 7's lift onto the orbital launch mount, which was completed relatively quickly using the chopsticks. Once secured to the stand, a new Raptor 2 engine was lifted into the business end of the booster, presumably to replace another, as just a short while later we saw this Raptor heading back to the production site on the back of a truck. The next day, during a gorgeous Texan sunset, Ship 24 was lifted up by the chopsticks and placed on top of Booster 7. I'm not sure whether this time of day was chosen for weather reasons, temperature reasons or aesthetic reasons, but whatever led to this time being chosen, it was certainly on the side of eye candy. The day after that, however, Ship 24 was taken off Booster 7 and held just above. Many were saying on the likes of Twitter that the ship was being destacked entirely, however it hadn't actually been fully disconnected from the GSE, so this wasn't happening. A short while later, S24 was placed back onto B7 once the realignment had finished. Something was still not right though, as on Sunday, Ship 24 was removed from B7 for good and returned to the ground. This was quickly followed by a reply from Elon Musk to a tweet by NSS Chris Gebhardt saying that SpaceX are proceeding carefully and a large explosion on the launch pad would set the program back by around six months. If we look closely at Ship 25, which is now fully stacked inside High Bay 1, we can see that SpaceX has been testing the Starlink dispenser door, lifting it up and closing it again several times. We know that the Starlink dispenser door on Ship 24 has been welded shut, so perhaps the V2 satellites destined for that ship's flight have been moved over to S25's flight. Younger sibling Ship 26 is currently under construction and just after the full stack of B7 and S24, its main body section was seen being moved inside of High Bay 1. Booster 9's topmost section is hiding away in High Bay 2, but we could still make out the grid fins being installed on Wednesday. So, what next? Hopefully S24 will return to the top of B7 soon so that SpaceX can perform ambient and cryogenic tank tests over the next few weeks in preparation for a static fire of multiple Raptor engines on the booster. This could lead up to an expected 33 engine static fire which is going to be incredibly loud before the first attempt to launch to orbit. Or could SpaceX just fast track to Booster 9 or Ship 25? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Starlink is expanding further into Japan, with SpaceX making a deal with the telecommunications company KDDI, who will resell the service to its pre-existing enterprise and civilian customers. Starlink connectivity is currently available over the northern half of the island of Honshu, with the southern boundary being just around Tokyo, but the rest of the country is expected to receive the service by the end of this year. Starlink is an ideal service for a country like Japan because although you may immediately think of the massive population centres of Tokyo, Kyoto and Osaka, much of the country is made up of vast mountainous regions and remote islands, something which Starlink is very suited for. The partnership with KDDI will hopefully bring in more customers for SpaceX, bringing in more revenue as Elon Musk shared on Twitter not too long ago that the service is quote, far from cash flow positive. If you have any connection to the UK, then this launch is the one it is impossible to not get excited for, as over the past seven days, the equipment for Virgin Orbit's Start Me Up flight has been arriving in Newquay. First up, the 747 carrier aircraft Cosmic Girl. She landed at approximately half six in the evening on Tuesday to a big crowd of people waiting on the apron and gathered outside of the airport perimeter. On Thursday, Cosmic Girl was taken for a quick circuit around the airfield before going for a full-blown flight rehearsal on Friday. Firstly, she flew up to MOD Boscombe Down for a quick touch and go before continuing out to the Atlantic, performing several loops as if they were about to drop the rocket. They couldn't have done that though because whilst Virgin Orbit was testing out Cosmic Girl, Launcher 1 was on its way across the Atlantic on board an RAF C-17. Landing late on Friday night, Launcher 1 was swiftly unloaded from the C-17 and rolled into the brand new integration hangar which is owned and operated by Spaceport Cornwall. The rocket looks a bit funky without the fairings but don't worry, they haven't been forgotten. They were delivered separately along with some other ground support equipment on another chartered 747 freighter. And although the excitement may make it seem like everything is ready to go, it isn't. Regulatory and physically. 
The equipment delivered over the past week still needs to be set up in Newquay and the payloads need to be integrated onto Launcher 1. The Civil Aviation Authority is still yet to give everyone involved the licenses required for the launch, but that is expected to arrive any day now. Let's also talk in depth about the payloads because there are some first timers in that bunch as well. There are four payloads from the UK, one of which is the first ever satellite to be produced in Wales. It's called Forge Star Zero, made by the Cardiff based company Spaceforge. They want to manufacture computer processors and chips in space where there is microgravity and then bring them back to Earth. The other three are Amber IOD 3, Prometheus 2, and Dover. Amber IOD-3 is the first of a 20-satellite constellation collecting maritime intelligence about the ocean. Prometheus-2 is a pair of CubeSats for the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory which will be used to test new ways to monitor and image radio signals. Dover is a small sat designed to help start up ESA's NAVISP program which aims to develop new technology for precise positioning and navigation. There are also three payloads from other countries on this flight, being SIRS from the USA, a pair of CubeSats monitoring space weather, a MAN from Oman, the nation's first ever orbital flight, and Stork 6, the sixth addition to Poland's Stork Earth Observation constellation. The most recent information I have on the launch date is still just November, which is a 30-day window. I really hope the launch license comes soon, allowing Virgin Orbit to publish an official date they are working towards because I cannot wait for this extremely exciting mission. The UK is doing a good job at making the news this week as the Scottish-based company Skyrora suffered an anomaly following their launch of their suborbital Skylark L vehicle. This rocket is a test bed, giving Skyrora the experience they need in preparation for the first ever vertical launch from the UK, currently scheduled for 2023. Right now though, they're testing in Iceland and their most recent launch did not go to plan. Just after the vehicle left the pad in Langaness, the rocket veered off course and crashed into the Norwegian Sea 500 metres downrange. A bit closer than the 125 km altitude Skylark L is capable of. Failures like this are to be expected though, because having to teach yourself how to get to space whilst actually trying to get to space along the way is not the easiest job. Skyrora will be analysing the data and figuring out what went wrong so they can try again. Hopefully for a more successful flight. Starship may no longer be fully stacked, but a rocket that is now fully stacked is the mighty Ariane 6. ESA shared these images of the first launch vehicle, which has the liquid stages stacked on the launch pad with the payload fairing and all four solid rocket boosters strapped onto the side. At 1500 UTC this Wednesday, ESA, Ariane Space and Cinez are going to host a press conference unveiling the next steps for the Ariane 6 vehicle as well as hosting a Q&A session for attending media. This will be streamed on ESA Web TV which you can find on their website. We're starting off space traffic this week with a failure, with Rays 3 and some other payloads not surviving the flight of this Epsilon S. It launched at 0050 UTC on October 12th from the Uchinara Space Center in Kagoshima, Japan. The flight termination system was activated just before the separation of the second and third stages, leading to the unfortunate demise of all 280 kilos worth of the seven payloads. The next launch was a rare rocket, a Proton from Russia. Specifically, this was a Proton M DM3 vehicle, which launched at 1500 UTC, also on October 12th, from Site 8124 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. On board was the 1.6 ton Angosat 2 C and KU band communication satellite from the nation of Angola, and it was placed into a geostationary orbit. 22.53 Universal Time on, guess what, the 12th of October, saw the third launch of the day being this Long March 2C, carrying 5M SR01, an S-band synthetic aperture radar satellite from China. It launched from LC9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center. We had a two-day breather before China was flying once again with this Long March 2C, carrying three Yaogan 36 Group 2 satellites from LC3 and the Xichang Satellite Launch Center at 1912 UTC on October 14th. These reconnaissance satellites ended up in a 499 by 486 km low Earth orbit at a 34.99 degree inclination. Just before that launch from China, SpaceX's Crew-4 mission undocked from the International Space Station at 16.05 UTC. Following the deorbit burn, Crew Dragon Freedom splashed down in the Atlantic at 20.55 UTC, returning Commander Chell Lindgren, Pilot Robert Hines, Mission Specialist 1 Samantha Cristoforetti and Mission Specialist 2 Jessica Watkins to Earth following their six-month stay on the station. Their capsule was met by the recovery ship Megan and at the time of writing, it has just arrived at Port Canaveral. 
SpaceX were of course flying Falcon 9 once again this week, delivering UTELSAT's Hotbird 13F telecommunications satellite to a geostationary transfer orbit. This four and a half ton satellite was launched from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida at 0326 UTC on the 15th of October. This launch marks the 100th SpaceX launch from this specific pad, although it is only their 99th successful flight as CRS-7 back in 2015 failed to make it to orbit. The booster supporting this mission, B-1069, successfully returned to Earth, touching down on the drone ship. Just read the instructions, concluding its third flight. For the final launch of this week, Russia was flying their Angara 1.2, another rare type, being its third flight overall and its second of the year. Launching at 1955 UTC on the 15th of October from Site 35-1 at the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in northern Russia, the payload was Cosmos 2560, a classified reconnaissance satellite. Four launches are scheduled for the next seven days. First up, it's MKA-1, 2 and 3 on a boosterless Soyuz 2.1V. Then we have Starlink Group 4 Mission 36 from the Cape. Russia will be launching another Soyuz, this time with boosters from Vostochny, and OneWeb will be returning to launch since they lost their Soyuz flights on an Indian GSLV Mark III. A big thank you to our citizens of tomorrow who contribute financially once a month at whatever level they feel like contributing. If you want to get more from your Tomorrow experience with exclusive content and Discord channels, head to join.tmro.tv to add your name to the list of this awesome lot. It's an exciting week coming up on Tomorrow, and it's not just news and live shows. On Wednesday, Dr. Tamith Scove will be back with Space Weather, and on Friday we may have a live show, but I'm proud to announce that at 1800 UTC, also on Friday, the first part of our documentary series, It's Not Rocket Science, the British Space Programme, will be premiering. Make sure to set your reminders once it appears on the channel page. You will not want to miss it. Hopefully we'll see you for weather and the premiere, but until then, thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.